Good morning, everyone. This is Brad Mayfield. I'm the Director of Business Development with Greater Therapy Centers. Thanks for joining us this morning. Richard Evans uh, will be presenting our webinar this morning, uh, how to deal with NEOA. And very important topic, lots of people deal with it. So uh, after this brief introduction, we're going to get to it. Uh, a couple of announcements. Don't forget that we have these webinar uh, webinars set up every weekday for the remainder of this week. So tomorrow and Friday, I guess just two more. Uh, you can sign up uh, at the link on our Facebook page. As soon as the webinar is completed today, usually takes about an hour or so, it'll process and then be put up on the YouTube channel, Greater Therapy Center's YouTube channel. So if you miss something or want to review or send it to someone else, you're uh, more than welcome to go there, obviously, and check that out. Um, and there are, is a question box. You can type questions if you have them while the webinar is going on. I'll be monitoring that and jump back on at the end to try to answer any questions. Okay, so Richard Evans is here with us. Richard is the clinical director of the Southwest Fort Worth Greater Therapy Center's uh, location. He graduated with his doctorate of physical therapy from the University of North Texas Health Science Center in 2017. Uh, he has worked for GTC since graduation. Richard is currently working towards becoming board certified as a specialist in orthopedic physical therapy. He is certified in dry needling for musculoskeletal disorders and has completed advanced training in managing people with chronic low back pain as well as vestibular disorders. In his spare time, Richard likes to exercise, hike with his wife and two golden retrievers, and he has recently started taking up golf. Okay, so I'm gonna turn this over to you, Richard, and I will put myself on mute, but I'll be here to monitor. Thanks. All right, thanks, Brad. Morning, everybody. Thanks for joining me, uh, sharing some of your quarantine time with me. Uh, so today's topic is uh, how to deal with knee osteoarthritis. So this is probably one of the most common conditions that people come into clinic to see us about. Uh, more specifically, just general knee pain. And at some point in their life, they've been told that they have osteoarthritis. Um, and it, it's really pretty impactful and concerning for the people who uh, come to see us. Um, so a little bit about osteoarthritis. It is actually the most common joint disorder. Uh, and estimates out there say that about 25% or 54 million Americans have some form of osteoarthritis. Uh, about 80% of those cases are uh, regarding the knee, uh, but other common joints that uh, could have osteoarthritis include uh, hip joints, shoulder joints, and then various joints of the hand. Um, so I guess we should start off by defining osteoarthritis. Um, so if you just Googled uh, what is osteoarthritis, this is the definition you would get. Um, it is the degeneration of joint cartilage and the underlying bone, most common from middle age onward. Uh, now there are two different types of osteoarthritis. You have primary OA, um, which is degeneration of your cartilage and bone without any apparent underlying reason. So maybe there's just a genetic component that makes you predisposed to having your cartilage and bone breaking down. And then secondary OA, uh, which is usually a consequence of some sort of abnormal force at the knee. So maybe you had an injury in the past, your cartilage has some sort of defect, um, or you've got some sort of misalignment at the joint that, that causes abnormal loading of, of the knee surfaces themselves. I really don't like that definition. Um, I feel like when you use words like degeneration, it implies that things are progressive and irreversible uh, and that you will continually have loss of function. Uh, and so a good example of this would be degeneration of your skin. Uh, we call that wrinkles. Uh, we would never say that wrinkles would be degenerative skin disease. So why would we say that uh, kind of the normal changes that you see in a knee as you age is degenerative? Uh, the problem with that de definition of osteoarthritis is that it leads to some of these beliefs surrounding uh, the condition. Um, so all of these different things uh, are different phrases and beliefs that I've heard uh, directly from patients. Uh, so the first one is that running and exercising or lifting is bad for your knees. Uh, and that's just not true. So there was actually a study done in 2009. Uh, where they followed 45 different runners over an 18 year period. Uh, and they would periodically check in with them, uh, give them x-rays and monitor kind of the health of their knee. 
it was actually found that they actually had thicker cartilage and healthier needs compared to the control group of people who didn't run, lift, or exercise. Um, second thing that I hear consistently is that knee OA is caused by wear and tear. Uh, again, that's not really the truth. Um, while working a physical job or exercising might speed up the progression of thinning of the cartilage, uh, there's no real evidence that symptomatic OA is because of wear and tear on the knee joint. Uh, next thing I hear a lot, and this is usually from people coming in uh, trying to put off a knee replacement surgery, is that their osteoarthritis can only be fixed with surgery. Uh, at the surface, that makes sense. If you've got a joint that is worn out, um, logically, the only thing that would fix it is to cut it out and put a new one in. Uh, well, hopefully, with this presentation, I can convince you that that is not necessarily true and show you some other ways to manage your osteoarthritis without surgery. And then the last thing that I hear almost on a daily basis is that my knees are bone on bone. Um, while there's some of that that might be true, so if your cartilage is thinning, you might have some of the underlying bone coming in contact with the underlying bone of your tibia. Uh, your knees are not just bone on bone. There's usually still some cartilage there, and maybe in very, very, very severe case of, cases of osteoarthritis, uh, do you have that true bone on bone uh, condition? Uh, so here's the definition of knee osteoarthritis that I like and that I use with my clients. Um, so we define it as a gradual and progressive sensitizing of normal biological change to the surface of the knee joint. So as you age, your cartilage may become thinner, and then when it turns into a symptomatic osteoarthritis or knee pain, we're saying that, that for some reason that knee joint is sensitive uh, and that sens sensitizing can be driven by a host of different factors uh, including excessive body fat, poor diet, lack of sleep, maybe overworking or overloading the knee or uh, kind of the opposite of that, a chronic underloading of the knee. Um, some people can just be genetically predisposed to having more sensitive joints and then other comorbid conditions like depression or anxiety can actually drive that whole sensitizing process. Um, one thing that all of these different uh, factors have in common is that they usually lead to uh, an increase in systemic inflammation in the body. And what science and research is telling us now is that it is the inflammation at the knee joint and kind of the total body inflammation that is probably more responsible for having a symptomatic osteoarthritis as opposed to the wear and tear and loss of uh, cartilage in the joint. Uh, so here are some different risk factors uh, that may predispose you uh, to developing knee osteoarthritis. So typically uh, we'll see this condition uh, in older people. Um, usually females are more affected by this condition than males. Uh, obesity is a huge risk, risk factor, and again, we think it's more due to kind of the systemic inflammation associated with obesity and meta metabolic disorders as opposed to the excessive weight on the joint itself. Uh, past history of joint injuries can alter the way that you uh, load the knee, and it can also lead to kind of a chronic inflammation at the knee joint, which again is not good. Uh, genetics is another big one. If you have a strong family history of osteoarthritis, uh, you are at a higher risk of developing this condition. Repeated stress on the joint, um, and I would say inappropriate repeated stressing of the joint. So maybe doing things that you're not accustomed to uh, or, or that your joint is not ready to, to do would, would possibly lead to you developing knee OA. Uh, and then different bone deformities. So I'm sure everyone has seen uh, people with these types of knees, if you're knock kneed or bow legged, uh, having that type of alignment at the knee can predispose you to developing uh, osteoarthritis. Um, you know, so when we're talking about osteoarthritis, uh, what is actually hurting? So everybody assumes that it is just uh, your femur rubbing away on the tibia and that's why it hurts. And they're, they're, it's actually a little more complex than that. And there are other structures in the knee that might actually be uh, generating or causing your pain. So the first structure is your Periosteum, it is a uh, thin layer of tissue that wraps around your bone. And sometimes that can become inflamed and, and lead to the pain that you feel uh, in the knee. The next thing is your 
synovial membrane. So uh, your knee is actually a closed system uh, filled with fluid and your synovial membrane makes it a closed system. Sometimes that lining can become inflamed, uh, resulting in a condition known as synovitis. Uh, it's a really painful condition, but again, not the bone rubbing on the other bone that's hurting. It's the lining of the knee that is uh, causing the pain there. And then sometimes you can actually have edema or inflammation in the bone itself. Um, you know, it is very uncommon for the fitting cartilage to actually hurt. Um, so in most cases, that is probably not causing your knee pain. It's more likely uh, one of these other structures. Um, you know, so uh, a lot of people have been told they have arthritis of their knees. So I think it's important to talk about how uh, OA in the knee is actually diagnosed. Uh, so it is actually a combination of both clinical symptoms and uh, x-ray results. Um, you can't diagnose osteoarthritis uh, just with an x-ray and you can't diagnose just with clinical symptoms. Uh, so some of the symptoms, uh, clinical symptoms for knee OA include knee pain that is gradual and onset and may worsen with activity, uh, knee stiffness and swelling, and then pain uh, after prolonged sitting or resting that usually gets worse the longer you do those activities. Um, now, as far as diagnosing osteoarthritis on an x-ray, there are a lot of variables at play there. Um, so the severity of your OA uh, will actually vary based on what radiologist is actually reading the x-ray and what grading scale they use. Um, so hopefully, I uh, don't bore anyone too much with this, but let's talk about uh, how x-rays are actually graded because uh, I hear very often patients coming in and they say that their uh, orthopedic doc walked in and they put an x-ray up on the wall and said, well, you're bone on bone, uh, it's time to cut it out, put a knee in, um, without the doc actually explaining you know, what they saw on the x-ray. Um, so when these professionals are, are grading your x-ray, they'll use a scale here or two scales that I found, and there are, there are multiple scales out there, but they essentially grade it based on a few factors. So they're looking at the amount of joint space uh, in your knee, and then they're also looking at the presence of bone spurs or osteophytes. Um, so in that top scale, they grade it from one to five, and really they're, they're just looking at the uh, decrease in available joint space. So grade one would be less than three millimeters, Grade two were, would be where you're on that bone-on-bone -bone condition where there is no joint space. Grade three, you're actually gonna see flattening of the bone because the bones are starting to intrude upon each other. And then grade four, the flattening's more severe. Uh, and then grade five, uh, the, the flattening's become very severe, more than 10 millimeters of flattening. For the second scale, they're actually looking at a combination of joint space and presence of bone spurs. Um, so in a grade one, you have possible narrowing of the joint space and then maybe some bone spurs forming all the way up to grade four where there are multiple large bone spurs and a severe decrease in joint space. What's interesting is uh, that there have been lots of studies done to see how well uh, x-rays and knee pain are actually related. There was a systematic review meaning uh, they took a look at a bunch of different randomized control trials uh, and they were trying to look at the relationship between x-ray findings of OA or radiographic osteoarthritis and then patients' subjective reports of knee pain. And the results are pretty surprising. So the results range from study to study. A lot of that depended upon what grading scale uh, the studies used to de define radiographic osteoarthritis, um, what pain scale they used. So, uh, you know, how long have you had pain? What, what type of pain are you having? And that varied from study to study. Um, but what they found is that anywhere from 15 to 76% of people with knee pain had radiographic osteoarthritis, or we could kind of put that in reverse. There were up to 85% of people with knee pain that did not have radiographic osteoarthritis. They also found that 15 to 81% of people that actually had evidence of osteoarthritis on an x-ray reported knee pain. Uh, again, we could put the reverse of that out there and that meant that 85% of people uh, who had a radiographic evidence of osteoarthritis did not have any knee pain whatsoever. Um, 
well, it's interesting. Even when they broadened their definition of radiographic osteoarthritis and, and they used every single one of the grades uh, on this grading scale here, they still only had 63% of people who had knee pain have evidence of osteoarthritis. Um, so essentially what this means is don't put all of your uh, eggs into the basket of the x-ray. Um, so just because your x-ray says that you have osteoarthritis doesn't mean your knee has to hurt. And just because your knee hurts does not mean that your x-ray is going to show osteoarthritis. Um, so let's talk a little bit about treatment options. I think that's what most people are tuning into this webinar for. Um, there are currently kind of two schools of thoughts. So you have the surgical option, which is a knee replacement. Uh, it is currently the most performed inpatient surgical procedure in the U.S. and is actually projected to reach 3.48 million procedures annually by 2030. Uh, and knee replacements are usually best for end-stage or severe osteoarthritis. So people who are grade four, grade five on those two scales that we looked at earlier. Um, they, they've done studies where they took a look at outcomes for people who had their knee replaced when they were only diagnosed with mild to moderate cases of OA, uh, and their outcomes were not as good as if uh, they waited until their OA was end stage or severe. So meaning uh, they didn't see a significant decrease in, in pain, they didn't see a significant improvement in function, um, and a large percentage of those people actually regretted having the knee replacement uh, because the whole rehab process and, and things that go into having that surgery uh, was actually worse than what they were dealing with before surgery. Uh, some different non-surgical options uh, would be activity modification, uh, physical therapy, you can try weight loss, knee braces, different over-the-counter medicines. Uh, there are some joint supplements that you can take. Uh, and then uh, a lot of people are familiar with like corticosteroid injections and, and stem cell injections for the knee as well. And we'll talk a little bit about those a little further in the presentation here. Uh, so we do see a lot of people who've had knee replacements. Uh, it's also known as a total knee arthroplasty. Uh, if you've had one of these, you've probably heard your PT use the, the phrase TKA, and that's what we're referring to when we say that. So in a knee replacement, uh, your joint surfaces are actually trimmed back and capped with uh, metal and plastic. Uh, this usually leads to a few weeks of in-home therapy, and then two to three months of outpatient rehab where you're working on decreasing swelling in the joint, improving your range of motion, and then trying to restore your strength to where you're functional with all of your normal daily tasks. Uh, some different non-surgical treatments we talked about. Uh, activity modification. So if your knees really hurt uh, when you're doing a certain exercise or a certain activity, uh, try to modify it so that your knees don't hurt. I know that seems pretty simple, but sometimes a simple answer is the best. Uh, weight loss has been shown to really help with people's reports of knee pain. And again, it has less to do with the actual weight uh, on the joint itself and more to do with decreasing kind of the systemic inflammation associated with uh, obesity and metabolic syndrome. And the knee bracing is actually a, a proven uh, intervention that can help, especially if you have mal malalignment at the knee. Um, so if you have normal alignment, like that first uh, uh, picture there, the knee brace probably isn't going to help too much, but if you are bow-legged or knock kneed, wearing a brace that can shift the alignment of your knee some could help you put off a knee replacement uh, as long as possible. Other non-surgical treatment options, uh, taking NSAIDs or Tylenol can help managing uh, acute episodes of knee pain. Uh, if we think it's the inflammation that's causing your symptoms, sometimes just taking an anti-inflammatory can be enough to knock out that knee pain you have after uh, spring cleaning or playing softball uh, over the weekend. Uh, glucosamine and chondri chondritin are two different joint supplements that have been pretty well studied. Uh, they've got some decent evidence to suggest that when you use them together, uh, it decreases or people report a decrease in the amount of pain they have in their knees. Uh, the whole thought process behind that is uh, it can help slow down the thinning of the cartilage uh, whether or not that actually occurs is kind of up for debate, and the evidence doesn't really support that, but uh, it's over-the-counter, it's safe to use, uh, and if it's going to keep you from having one of these more uh, invasive inter interventions, I'd say try it and, and you know see how it does for you. Um, corticosteroid injections are, are a big one. 
Uh, most people I see in clinic have tried cortisone injections in the, in the knee. Um, most people report at least a week or two of feeling pretty good. But then the story with corticosteroid injections is that it, it doesn't last forever. So they'll get one or two weeks of feeling good. And then three or four months down the line, their knees start to hurt again. Um, and this is actually what research shows time and time. Again, people report uh, benefit in the short term. Uh, but in the long run, it, it's not really as effective as some of these other interventions. Um, so when deciding whether or not to have a steroid injection, I would say if it's going to help you be more active in the short term and do some of these things that are going to give you long-term relief, then I'm all for it. One of the potential side effects, though, of repeated cortisone injections is that it can actually speed up the breakdown of cartilage in the knee as well as uh lead you to be at an increased risk of uh, ligament injuries uh, as cortisone can actually weaken the collagen uh, tissue in your ligaments. Uh, and then one intervention that I've heard a lot of recently, I've had a lot of questions regarding, would be stem cell injections. Um, I feel like there's a new clinic uh, promoting stem cells that pops up every other weekend. Um, it is a fairly new intervention. Uh, it is very expensive and insurance usually doesn't cover it only because the research behind it isn't really strong to say that it is better than any other uh, type of treatment available. Um, it is not a very risky procedure. So if this is something that you feel like would really benefit you, I'd recommend trying it, but you're looking at spending anywhere from two to $5,000 a knee. Uh, and so sometimes that's enough to turn people off of that treatment only because of the, the cost of it. Uh, all right, here's my favorite non-surgical intervention, uh, exercise or physical therapy. Uh, and so when you're exercising or you're coming to physical therapy, some of the benefits that you will see is that, you know, we're working on reducing your knee pain, improving your quality of life and improving your physical function. Um, they've done numerous studies on efficacy of exercise on knee osteoarthritis. And what they found time and time again is that the benefits of exercise are actually lost when you stop the program. And this is something that we see uh, here in clinic. People come to see us for four to six weeks. They feel really good. Uh, they leave therapy. They stop doing their exercises. And then two or three months down the road, their knees start to hurt again. So this is really a lifestyle change that you have to make. And you've got to be really consistent with uh, if you're wanting to put off uh, a knee replacement. Um, so, you know, I get this question a lot. How does exercise actually help osteoarthritis? And a lot of people still have that mindset that exercise is actually just going to wear away uh, the remaining cartilage in their knee and they can't do that because they need to say that they have. Um, that is absolutely not true. So again, that thinning of the cartilage is a normal biological process. And like we talked about a little earlier, people who exercise or runners actually have healthier and thicker cartilage. Um, cartilage actually does not have a very good blood supply to it. And so it receives its nutrients uh, by circulation of the synovial fluid in your knee. And that synovial fluid will actually circulate throughout the knee with exercise. So if you're a very sedentary person, you don't do a whole lot, uh, you're actually decreasing the amount of nutrients that your cartilage is getting. Um, other than that, exercise can actually decrease uh, inflammation in the knee. And this is kind of counterintuitive to what a lot of people think. You would think that if you've got a knee that hurts and you start exercising, it's going to swell more. While that might be true in the short term, long term exercise has actually been shown to, like I said, decrease uh, some of those different markers of inflammation in the knee, as well as increase the concentration of different chemicals that are protective to the knee. Um, and it also helps restore the normal levels of lubricant in the knee. And lubricant is exactly what it sounds like. It is actually a lubricant uh, for your knee joint. Is the production of that is actually stimulated by exercise. <clears throat> uh, this is another question I get uh, almost every day. What exercise is the best for my knee? Um, people aren't too happy with my answer because they want a very specific exercise. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that the best exercise is one that you can do consistently. Um, it's one that is realistic for your current level of fitness. Uh, and then it is some mix of aerobic exercise, something that gets your heart rate up, uh, a little bit of resistance training to help improve the strength of the muscles around the knee, 
and then some balance training because one common complaint we have uh, a lot of and people who have osteoarthritis is that their knee just feels very unstable it feels like it's going to give out on them so practicing balance can help get rid of that sensation and then kind of the last point you want to make sure that these exercises aren't too painful to perform um, so a lot of people have the mindset of no pain, no gain. I've got to push through the pain. Um, and while, you know, that might be true for some conditions, if you're dealing with osteoarthritis, it's best just to find exercises that feel good and let the inflammation in the joints settle down. Um, doesn't mean you have to avoid anything forever, but if running hurts, uh, uh, if running hurts your knee, then maybe you stop running for a couple weeks, let your knee calm down, and then gradually get back uh, into exercise. Um, oftentimes people tell me that arthritis is kind of like this vicious cycle. So you start off with knee pain, uh, and because your knees hurt, you end up decreasing your activity, resting, sitting on the couch, eating cheese puffs, watching Netflix. Uh, eventually your knees start to feel better. But while you're resting, uh, you've actually had decreased muscle strength in the legs. Your cartilage is no longer as healthy because you're not spreading that lubricant around the joint. Uh, but eventually your knee feels good because you haven't been doing anything. So then you get back to uh, exercise with decreased loading capacity of the knee because you haven't been working out, so your knees are weaker. Uh, and you go back to your normal level of activity without any modifications. So, you know, your knees hurt when you run, uh, you take four weeks off to let them feel better, and you jump right back into your normal level of running, and your knee hurts again, and then you repeat the cycle. Um, so what we have to work on is trying to break people out of that cycle. So how do you break that cycle? Uh, I'd say the first step in breaking that cycle is making sure that you get your knee pain accurately diagnosed. Um, so we know based on research that people are going to have radiographic osteoarthritis as they get older. It's just like your hair getting gray, like your skin developing wrinkles. Your cartilage is going to thin. You're going to develop bone spurs. And so if you have knee pain and the first thing you do is get an x-ray and they tell you, oh, yeah, you've got bone on bone knees, you've got arthritis, um, you're going to be in this mindset that, well, I need to have my knee replaced, my knee's worn out. Um, and that might not necessarily be the thing that is causing your pain. Um, there are lots of other conditions that can cause knee pain. It could be referred pain from your low back. We see that pretty, pretty regularly. It could be a tendon injury could be a ligament sprain, it could be a muscle sprain. Um, so trying to get your knee pain accurately diagnosed is the first step in breaking that cycle. The second step is coming up with a rehab plan that fits your lifestyle. Um, so if you were never a weightlifter before your knee started hurting, uh, deciding to just start lifting weights uh, every single day of the week is probably not gonna be very realistic for you. Uh, and it's gonna lead to you falling off of uh, that rehab plan and, and not doing what you need to do. So coming up with a plan that uh, is realistic and reasonable and something that you can stick to is the next step. And then the third step is try to identify sources of inflammation in your life. So uh, take a look at your diet. Are you eating a bunch of foods that are responsible for uh, maybe like the systemic inflammation in the body? Could you stand to lose a little bit of weight? I know since this quarantine has started, I put on the quarantine uh, body weight for sure. And that's something that I probably need to work on getting off. Uh, and then if you join me for my first webinar, we talked a lot about your sleep habits and sleep hygiene. Uh, that ties into this as well. If you're not really sleeping, that's going to lead to uh, greater levels of inflammation in the body. So taking a step back and, and maybe not looking directly at your knee, but looking at you as a whole person uh, can sometimes help figure out and, and treat what's going on in the knee and breaking you out of that cycle. Um, and I just want to do another pitch here like I did, did at the end of my first webinar. Uh, if you are dealing with knee pain and you need help breaking yourself out of that cycle, we are offering telehealth evaluations. Uh, we know that Texas is starting to open their state up, uh, so we are seeing patients in clinic where we're keeping it one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, if that's something you're comfortable with, we can see you in clinic, or if you'd rather just talk to me uh, on telehealth and see if we can't figure out what's going on with your knee, we can definitely do that. Uh, you can call our clinic at 817-294-4646 or directly email me. Um, I try to respond back as fast as possible and see if we can't figure out you know, what's going on with your knee and develop a plan that's going to help you feel better. Uh, so now I'll open it back up to Brad if anyone has any questions. Okay, thanks Richard. Um, excellent presentation. Um, 
I don't see any direct questions right now. So if you think of anything going forward, uh, make sure, like Richard said, you can certainly email him, call the clinic, you can call any of our clinics, but contact Richard directly, especially on this topic, and, and he can help guide you. Um, He's, he mentioned telehealth. Don't forget, again, that we're posting uh, the webinar schedule up on our Facebook page. We have a couple more this week. And then going forward, we plan on doing um, some recorded sessions um, at least a few times a month. So we'll continue to do that. Check back on our social media uh, outlets. We appreciate you joining us today and hope everyone has a great rest of the week. It's a beautiful day outside. So go outside and enjoy. Thanks, Richard. Thank you. Bye-bye.